So it's a great privilege now to introduce our next panel and our next moderator. So this is another panel that at the USAIC during our, our summit we have every year, which is around industry and academic partnerships. And um, something that we're doing again this year that we've done each of the last several years that we do this virtually is we don't give you any time for lunch, which means that I don't get any time for lunch. We have such rich content and we're using every minute of this day to, to bring that content to you. So uh, let me introduce please the moderator of this panel and then and then she'll introduce the panelists. And the moderator, we're so lucky to have Su Susan Hockfield joining us. Susan is, is an amazing uh, leader, leader um, an academician, academician, a neurobiologist, who spent most of her career at Yale, at Yale as, as a professor, professor ultimately in administration, administration um, growing, growing to become the provost at Yale, Yale and then spending almost a decade at MIT as, as, its, as, as its 10th president. president. And, and I'll, I'll say something about Susan, about Susan. But let me, but let me fast, fast forward to just, to just this past Monday, Monday where I had a chance to, to spend, spend time at the inauguration event for Sally Ann Kornbluth, who's the 18th president of MIT. And Sally Ann is the second female president and the second life sciences, second president with a life sciences background, which is amazing. But it means there had to have been a first female president and a first president with a life science background. And that happens to be our very own Susan Hockfield. So Susan, thank you very much, Dr. Hockfield, for joining us, and I will hand it over to you. Uh, thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, the inauguration was a trip. It is always very exciting when the baton gets passed, and I am delighted that Sally Cornbooth is uh, taking over as MIT's president. Delighted and proud, and second woman, and second biologist. More destructive than being a woman, I can tell you. Having experienced it. <laughs> so uh, listen, I am so delighted to moderate today's panel of really superstars to help us think together about the current state of, and more importantly, the as yet untapped potential of academic industry partnerships, um, which is really at the core of this industry. And um, one of the things that was exciting about joining MIT is to jump into this world, this incredibly vibrant, rich world of uh, the ability to make great discoveries and then translate those discoveries from the bench to the bedside. So I'm really delighted to be here. And um, the panelists, I say, could not be more stellar. I will briefly introduce them now, um, starting at the end of the alphabet with Ilya Zerhouni, Vice Chairman and President of Opco Health, um, Marcus Schindler, Executive Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at Novo Nordisk, Matai Mammon, CEO Designate of Fog Pharma, my colleague at MIT, Phil Sharp, Institute Professor at the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research at MIT, and Priya Singha, Executive Vice President and Head of Development and Interim Head of Research in Global Safety and Regulatory Sciences at Biogen. So I'm gonna just give a very brief introduction because I want the panelists to have as much time as possible to share their views. But I have to tell you, I mean, I think we all know that the rate of change over the last oh, 15 years or so in terms of new therapies, new drugs has been absolutely breathtaking. There is still unmet patient and industry demand for new therapies. And it's clear that uh, we must increasingly depend on academic institutions for industry innovation. The structured approach that's in use today started in 2007, which is almost 16 years ago. And so today in our panel, we're gonna consider how these alliances have fared so far. What are we doing to enhance the relationships and make them more productive? What are the key performance indicators to measure success? And um, you know, the big question is, where do we go from here? How do we accelerate what's a robust activity? How do we make it even more impactful? So um, let's get started. I'm gonna start with um, what I call the inside scoop. And I think just it would be fabulous to hear from each of you. What we'd like to know about your experience with these alliances. And if each of you relatively rapidly could um, share with us one story, either a great success or a horror story about these alliances and, and what was the cause of that success or failure. Um, and I'm just gonna go through the um, posted stamps on my screen and call on you one by one. So Marcus, would you mind starting this off? Not at all, thank you so much, Susan. And um, I actually wanted to start with, with my own career, which happened to start at the Glaxo Institute of Applied Pharmacology. So an industry-sponsored research institute, you know, led by 
an industry veteran, but also embedded in an academic environment. And for me, that has been really formative and, you know, being there throughout the career that you need to be, you know, scientifically excellent, but translated to, to pharmaceutical research. And I think understanding along the way that, you know, we have distinct roles to play in this, you know, has been super important for me. And one great example, actually, not far from here, I'm sitting right now overseeing Candle Square here, um, happened at the, the, the Whitehead Institute, where we actually worked with Rudolf Jenisch and, and um, uh, Rick Young and others with an embedded scientist from Novo Nordisk for a couple of years. And they really generously opened their doors to that person, let him participate in everything they did. And we worked together on molecular condensates in diabetes, right? And as they said, well, they were wouldn't have never thought of diabetes, they would have worked on cancer or something else. So we brought something unique to the table. Um, and they did, of course. And um, out of that came sort of a biotech spin out viewpoint, which we're also no, now collaborating with. And for me, that is a piece really of, of transparency and openness and generosity to let people participate. But then also over the years, let, let these things take their course and develop into something that I think is of, of mutual benefit. That's fabulous. And it's a wonderful example because people imagine that the transfer is done by throwing things over the fence. And, you know, you've just illustrated the incredible importance of a really intimate and integrated approach. Matai, how about you? Do you have a, a success story or a horror story or maybe both you want to share with us? No, it's a, it's a great question. And I'll, I'll talk about a success story in a, in a moment, but just to contextualize the answer, you know, our, the, as you said, right at the beginning, Susan, like the unmet needs are all around us. Like in most areas of medicine, they're inadequate. In most areas of treatment, health, there's inadequate medicines. And so it's a hugely difficult task that's collaborative, um, even outside of academia industry. These are so many other kinds of collaborations with government and uh, manufacturers and pharma service groups and dirt data purveyors and all these like groups. And so this specific interface is absolutely critical, as you said. And one really good thing, one really a feature of our industry, feature of our world is there's so many different models being tried. Um, if it wasn't for that, I don't know what the best way is of collaborating. Um, a really good example that's worked out really well in my previous job at J&J is the collaboration with uh, Remnick Xavier's group. Um, and it's been at, uh, at the, the Broad and MGH. And it's been a really good example because I think right up front, years back, some of the barriers to collaboration were addressed head on like how best to handle differences in mission sometimes, like we're advancing knowledge um, through somewhat undirected work is often historically what has given rise to like incredible breakthroughs. That's a different mission than translating uh, science to a product that is meant to serve patients. And um, the other big area that just needs alignment and pre-discussion, and this is what makes collaboration successful, is how to handle um, knowledge and intellectual property. I've seen like lots of, I've seen in fact the majority of academic industry relationships sour at some point because of that. Like when you publish, when there's patents versus uh, uh, peer reviewed publications, uh, when you talk about something, when you don't, so, uh, you know, Remnick and the, the team at, at Janssen did a really amazing job over many years bringing forward biology that was uh, only really discoverable in academia and married it well to the translational machinery and the excellence in all sorts of downstream activities within J&J. &J. So that's a, a great example, but it needs to be handled. Some of these barriers are very real there to be understood and managed right at the beginning, not halfway through. Thanks, Matai. That's really great insight. Maybe we can come back to this at the end in terms of how do we really accelerate things. Phil Sharp, my colleague. Um, my first collaboration with industry was in 78 and interacting and starting Biogen because we were a bunch of academic scientists and we formed an advisory board and, and then we worked with management to start a company and I was chair of the advisory board for over 25 years. So it, it became part of the collaboration. Since then at MIT, I've been uh, head of many collaborations with industry. 
I'm sorry to say, and we've avoided horror stories, but, and the reason for that is that the, the two parties had a full understanding of what both parties can bring to the, to the collaboration. And I'll take the example of Merck. Ed Skolnick was head of research at Merck. He wanted to actually build relationships in Cambridge and at MIT. We started a collaboration. He learned about faculty. He learned about what we were doing. We used the resources to stimulate a lot of young faculty to get involved. We started programs training engineers in biology because the Merck wanted more people in that space. And we supported very excellent research, which they learned about. But Ed knew and I knew that we weren't developing products at MIT. We were developing people and science, and that's what they wanted. And we had a very effective collaboration. Mm -hmm. Now, you can be more oriented towards particular disciplines now, but that was a, a very successful collaboration. Great, thank you. Shared understanding of everyone's roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Priya? Oh, you're on thank mute. You. Oh, there you are, great. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, excellent to be on the panel with all of you. And uh, I'll just start by saying that, you know, I think I believe, and I know at Biogen this is true, uh, Phil led by you that many years ago that it's really a team sport, everything that we do. So we see this interface and we see the collaboration between industry and, and academia as an absolute prerequisite. We also see it, I think, Matai, to your point, you know, we see it across the chain. So we, we, we explore it for CMC, you know, targets, human biology, building medicines and more. I think we've had many, many successful collaborations, but one that stands out for me is a collaboration that we had with a university in the Netherlands. And the reason that I think this was very unique is about the uh, clarity at the outset, which was also mentioned about setting expectations, about being very clear what the incentives were on both sides, what the goals and objectives were, and as part of this collaboration, what we ended up doing is we were looking at early biology and targets, but we hosted each other's scientists for a six month period. And that made a very big difference because it was sort of walking uh, two moons in, in someone else's shoes and being on the other side. And we had that end point and objective of delivering on the publications and the science. So I think that that was one that stands out in my memory, but we've had many. And I agree that some of these expectations need to be set at the outset and not midway because it's already too late if you do that. The other point I'll make is sometimes we have very large umbrella agreements with not as much clarity. And I found it to be much better in the reverse, which is you start off with a very focused collaboration and depending on milestones, expectations, and success, you expand it. That works much better in my uh, experience. Thank you. Thanks very much, Priya. Great insights. Ilyas, please. Yeah, that's a great question, Susan. So I'll just share with you um, what didn't work and, and then share with you what worked. And I think some of the points have already been made. The one thing that didn't work in my life in academia as an executive vice dean, and, and when I uh, when when I remember the um, you know the the tendency at the time was to do institution to institution partnerships. So the university X would work with company Y, and then they would work together, have a common committee, and and try to make something happen. That was an utter failure. It didn't work, and you can tell, I, I won't name names, but there are examples we all know of great programs with multi-million dollars that just didn't happen because of what Priya and Matai already said. It's almost like, you know, academia, the product of academia is knowledge and trained scientists and, technology and, and engineers. The product of industries is products, and those two don't, don't match. It's almost like uh, oil and water. 
<laughs> so what does work? You need an emulsifier. You know, to mix oil and water, you need an intermediate. <laughs> and I think that the intermediate are either things that can work, like separate institutes that are funded by industry, close by academic uh, ecosystems like the Novartis Institute at Bo in Boston and many, many of the R&D organizations that are now coming to Boston seek to benefit from an informal network. What did work for me was uh, something that actually Andy uh, knows well, was the notion that the uh, pharma company would reach out to academic um, teams uh, with the following characteristics. Number one, it had to be a great scientific idea from, from, you know, with really um, great science and great scientists. It's not enough to have an idea. You have to have the originators of the idea on board. The second is the company itself had to understand the, um, the, the constraints on, on each side that the academic team really needed to have support. But you could not provide support without creating a, an intermediary, which is a biotech company, which is the model that most people follow today. But to do that, you need an assembler. And this is something that I don't think we, we put a lot, of, a lot of attention because you need someone who is trusted by all parties, uh, who is a super connector and assembles the components. And so we work with Third Rock uh, Venture and with uh, um, the, the, you know, Cricket um, Seidman and, and her husband because they knew the genetics. We worked with uh, Spudich at Yale because he had figured out the structure of myosin and acting. And, and with Andy's um, insight, he, he told me, he said, this is really something we need to support. And we made a, 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 a common endeavor called myocardia. And the idea there that was that everybody thought would, would be a, a wild goose chase was that we had a genetically driven science with a biophysically understood mechanism and the capacity of a third party put together. Actually, I, I credit Charles Humsey for being the assembler in this case. And so I think this is my experience. Institution to institution doesn't work. Specific idea, specific team uh, assembled by an intelligent super connector who is really connecting capital sources knowledge sources, skill sets, academia, industry, that works. And that, I've seen examples of that. Uh, I think flagship uh, pioneering essentially is a super connector, super assembler. So I will stop there. Thanks. It's really um, an in interesting to have articulated that particular role. The, uh, you know, the mixing, you know, the, the uh, I want to call it the whisk <laughs> that brings mm -hmm. all the, piece, the, the parts together. Thanks. Uh, Shiv, let, give us your thoughts, please. Well, it was very educative, and I echo what uh, Elias has said, uh, especially in a country like India, at this Indo-US forum. Uh, the academia wants to work with industry, but the government has a feeling that any scientist who works with industry is probably has some vested interest. And the vested interest is that he may be funded or he may have, you know, uh, you know some other kind of, uh, you know, support. So the best way is to have a biotech, uh, you know, incubator. And uh, very recently we have tried to explore this. The government has set up in India at least uh, several biotech such uh, innovator things in the medical institutes. Till a few years ago, they were only done in the uh, engineering colleges or in you know, a management colleges. So all these collaboration of academia and the industry was not happening in the medical schools. So I think it has started just this year or a year before. Uh, there are now incubators and this uh, collaborations coming. However, I still uh, I remember long, long ago uh, that in many institutes, uh, the industry was supporting the several uh, positions for faculty, but the positions for faculty were at the choice of the investigator. This thing has not come to India. My mm -hmm. feeling is uh, with you, Suzanne, and all the other people, 
there should be a mechanism by which we can have people with overseas who could come and work and they are supported so you have a not only uh, us based or india based but we have a bilateral relation if people like you or uh, andrew or someone or philip can come uh, and the industry supports without vested interest and you spend 3 months or maybe not 3 months 3 weeks and set up the ball rolling for the country i think it will do a lot good for india so we need a very transparent system where we can have you as the industry leaders come to academia maybe work maybe stimulate enthuse and i work at the institute for liver and biliary sciences which is the only dedicated liver university globally we see close to 1 lakh 120000 liver patients in a year with all that we still do not have products and we still do not have a platform so it would be encouraged uh, if you people join hands on this thank you really interesting sanjeev do you want to wrap with your own experiences share please i'm afraid you're on mute you could i'm mute will hear you thank you yeah thank you very much and uh, excellent discussion and uh, pleasure to be here uh, my uh, experience with in- industry is good we have done recently a, a nasal trial for covid uh, covid vaccine and it was very successful nowadays and we are using as a booster dose and as said by professor in that in india uh, we have collaboration with industry and i am working at all india institute of medical science in new delhi where uh, we have collaboration with uh, many industry partners and doing successful research thank you thank you very much um i have to tell you i'm just going to make make a, a, a an observation um so many of you highlighted something that surprises me which is the real physical cohabitation you know there there is a sense that you know there's a piece of the work that gets done in the academy and a different piece of the work that gets done in industry and you know this this idea that actually having people real humans uh from the other entity living and breathing and working together i think is um really powerful and you've all you know articulated just how much much that that helps move things along so um i want to you know ask a question more of perception um but i think it's an important one which is that um uh for reasons i don't understand but because the successes have been so numerous and so unbelievable that they've been, we've been able to develop drugs and that ideas from the academy have made their way into industry products when you talk to people about it, there's a huge amount of negativity you know and the general kind of receive women uh, re- receive receive knowledge is that the um you know that these academic industry collaborations are not productive that they're unproductive and is that just a question of numbers i get ask any of you to to speak to this is why has this reputation evolved is it well deserved um and if so you know what should we be doing if not what can we do to change the uh change the 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 story line about it but it i would say that the uh, general public view of these collaborations are don't reflect the optimism and the productivity that all of you have just talked about. Uh so how do we um either or both um make more of these happen but also change the uh the storyline. And I'm not going to call on people so you just speak up please. I can start. This is Priya. Please. And and maybe what I can offer is that without that initial setting of expectations trust respect and clear goals of the common collaboration i think it's very hard to even define success so i think one thing i have noted is that when we're not clear in our contracts about exactly what we're attempting to do then the story is lost and there's dissatisfaction on both sides so i do think that that's important the other the other aspect that was mentioned is absolute and total clarity on publication strategy timing and intellectual property because these have huge impacts 
uh, both to industry and academia. And we need to be very vigilant and, and you know, trusting and transparent. So I think transparency and trust to me can set the stage. But currently we may be suffering from, you know, some of the uh, maybe not so great uh, stories being out there in the public that are driving the dialogue. I, I do think there's a lot of success, but I think that the ones that get the attention are the negative stories. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think we need to turn that tide. And trust and transparency is the only way to drive it forward. Maybe I can build on, I think, Priya's excellent points, which I think is a super important um, baseline. But maybe there's a thought also to, to redefine what productivity actually looks like, because we internally did an analysis on how many tangible targets and molecules actually entered the pipeline or progressed through the pipeline out of academic collaborations. Now, that number wasn't large. So if, if you look at that, the productivity might have been seen as low. But out of many of the collaborations, have we gotten joint publications? We have grown our network. We've really deepened the understanding of the biology and the technology we were working on. Um, and I think to, to Priya's point, you know, if, if we don't see that as a success also in industry, then of course we might be disappointed. So that's number one. The other piece I think is important is the element of time, right? To work on fundamental biology, you know, some process that it might take years, decades, until some of those things, siRNA, mRNA, actually turn into something that the world sees as useful. Yeah, and, and often we have moved on then in, in, in that space and forgotten sort of the founding, um, you know, academic contributions at, at, at that time. So I think it's really to pause maybe and redefine and be very clear about that also publications, you know, understanding of biology, you know, is a product and a valuable product also for us in pharma. So both of you, Priya and Marcus, you've illustrated something that um, when you're on one side of the divide, you think if we just had this one magic thing from the other side, everything would be solved. And it's kind of a mutual set of wrong expectations. And, you know, I love the idea that you're both talking about is setting out very clear expectations based on experience. I mean, obviously, this was new, frankly, not so long ago, but, you know, 16, 17 years seems like a long time or 20 years um, but I don't know that we have a, 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 a good formulation of, yeah, how you set expectations in ways that Maybe, uh, have a greater chance. Can I try? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Try one comment just based on what you just said, yeah. Susan, and the yeah. excellent comments of both Marcus and Priya here. Like, so one principle that I, you know, maybe it's wrong to, to over-index on it, but one principle that does seem to have held uh, to define success to me is the degree to which work is directed. Um, and so it's, there's a spectrum there. I think if work is very undirected, like if it's curiosity driven to the extreme, um, then you know the, the government industry uh, interface is often best. And those, those sometimes I, I get worried if those become too applied and too directed and too goal-oriented. In, in industry academia, in academic uh, collaborations, where it sometimes fails or falls apart is when um, the it's an, there's an attempt to be too far one way or the other. If it's very undirected, then the time frame for any kind of tangible success might be literally decades. So it, it might be one of those things where, in retrospect, you rationalize talent and and knowledge being infused into the system, but on any normal measure of success, like within the company, it'll be seen, you know, even 10 years out as, oh, it didn't yield anything. So then on the other hand, I've seen it fail also where um, it's very frustrating to the academic partner if it's so directed that the academic partner feels like a CRO. Mm -hmm. And that also is bad because there's no movement of knowledge. So I think you have to get it right within this spectrum on a degree of, you know, the degree of freedom that uh, the investigations or the, the research has, um, and, and both sides need to bend a little bit. And then out from that can flow the, you know, alignment on the intellectual property and publications, et cetera. But this degree of directedness, I think it is, is somewhat relevant. Can I add- uh, Go ahead, Alicia. No, just another dimension. I think all the comments are extremely correct in terms of analyzing the inside 
value of the relationship between the partners. But I think the perception may also be related to a, 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 a much larger issue, which is that there is an enormous frustration in the American public for the performance of our healthcare system mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that we spend twice as much as anybody else and uh, we have the worst statistics. That's really running in people's mind. And then when we say, well, you know, one of the great things we can do for you is work academia and industry to develop new products. And then the products are costing an enormous amount of money, which makes the people feel gouged. And then what you understand and what you hear is the uh, public advocacy groups who say, we're being really taken to the cleaners twice. One, we pay all this research with taxpayer funded NIH funds and others, and all the benefits and the profits go to the pharma companies who, by the way, are just working on rare diseases and cancer and have forgotten all the major diseases that we suffer from. So I think there is a political policy perception aspect out there that relates to the, the fact that the deal is, is wrong between academia and, and, and pharma and, and, and industry in the eyes of policymakers, Congress is always asking NIH, why is it that you don't get a larger return? After all, it's your inventions that the industry raids and uh, makes profits from that gouges the American public. I think the industry, the pharma industry is, is, is right now, the, the, the last word, when you have a, something that doesn't work as complex as healthcare, you need a villain. And I think the villain is pharma and it has become pharma to protect others who may be more responsible actually for the malfunction of the system. So I just like to bring that angle in addition to what was really uh, well said by, by the other speakers. Thanks, Elias. Phil, did I see you? No, I was just gonna okay. make an additional point. Uh, and that was uh, in, in striking these relationships, there's two sides to being transparent and able to value. And there are organizations that are basically basic science, curiosity driven, makes new discoveries. And there's organizations that are structured to be more impactful with large data, which is becoming a major issue in how we do science now. And the broad here at MIT is an example of the latter who has platforms that can do things that are absolutely unique in terms of the scale that you can probe data and gather it and analyze it. So striking these relationships, are, are it's important that both parties understand the capacity of the other and what drives the nature of the other's uh, uh, activities. Thank you. Shiv or Sanji, um, thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, go ahead, please, Shiv. Well, I was just wondering and recalling my uh, work, there are three or four types of uh, academia and industry partnership. The industry develops something and the academia uses, as uh, Professor Sinha said, we do the clinical trials. The second is that uh, academic person discovers a molecule and takes it to the industry, rather sells it or you know, have a partnership, which is rather rare. But if it does, it takes huge amount of time to make a large quantity of a protein or maybe convert it into a bio design. It's a huge challenge because there is no facility. So the first one is very easy. The industry does and you do the trial. But if an academic person does, there is no repository, there is no support system, and the industry always looks of what will I gain out of it. So there is sometimes a vested, you know, kind of a motive that whether we should support or we should not, and all that. I mean, it's not bad, but uh, for the academic partner, it is uh, uh, challenging. The third is that we co-develop something which very rarely occurs. 
like in the COVID time, there were things which could be developed by some universities and taken up for vaccine. So co-development. But to me, the best model is cohabitation, where cohabitation in the sense that you probably spend time, think it's an exchange of ideas, which is free. And that is very, very rare. And if you can provide a platform for cohabitation, you know, uh, this probably would be a you know, way of developing things. I recall my days at Yale. We wanted to develop something and the industry guy would come. He wouldn't even know what, you know, uh, where is the liver is. But the guy would tell you, look, this is the way you can develop it. And this was an MR guy. So the, the, the idea of having a collateral and literal thinking world to us, it doesn't exist. You go and see patients, come back and uh, I mean, teach and do go to the lab, but there is no incentive. So what I feel, the fourth matter, is where the minds can be put together into a soup and churn to get a new product, cohabitation. Thank you. Thank you. Sanjeev, do you want to add in or... Um... Oh, and you're on mute, I'm sorry. Uh... I have one question with panel, if you permit. Please. Yeah, so I have, my question is, uh, how can industry academia partnership better collaborate with research and development and innovation by bringing together industry and universities partners in application and infrastructure, including mm -hmm. uh, artificial intelligence for the students and scientists who are planning their future in in the industry. Okay. I, you know, I, I, I have to say, I love that question. And I love that question because what I've seen, you know, yeah. around the labs at MIT is the faculty are, you know, they're interested, they're, they're eager, but their trainees are lunatics. <laughs> yeah. And they are the uh, the glue, you know. They, you know, they you, we think about the the hybridizer is some upper you know level person, but actually, the true hybridizers end up being uh, these these young colleagues and um, I mean, I, 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 as I say, I just, I just love this question is how do we bring them, you know, into the mix? How do we expose them? Because they are going to be the future, you know, on, on, on both sides of this um, divide. But I think, so we only have a few minutes more. And I think that's kind of what, at the end of the day, what, um, you know, I've been directed to elicit from all of you, which is, you know, um, how do we attract the best people? How do we set up this kind of, not permanent cohabitation, but thinking groups, you know, ways to actually share ideas that the unexpected thing that no one has thought of yet is right. the thing that really comes out that we can, we can act on. And, um, you know, I mean, how do we establish new alliances and territories that are underappreciated? And I guess part of this is if you had your dream target, right? <laughs> your, your, your dream of future success, you know, first of all, what would it be? And, you know, what do you see as the path to it? I mean, how do we draw on the, the talents of our, from my perspective, our academic communities um, so that we can, you know, build the technologies and the drugs of the future a little bit faster than we've been able to do? Priya, you're nodding. Tell me what's on your mind. <laughs> Sure, I can get started. I think it's a great question and, it, and it's really important as we look to the future. So I'm gonna raise three points. First is that we believe we've got to go where the science is. So we are going global. We've got collaborations in, with Japanese universities, with Chinese universities across Europe and America and uh, hopefully more than that. And that's important because I think we have to go beyond uh, because there's good science in different places. And as I said, we're going across the chain. So they are experts in different regions. We're trying to tap that, number one. Number two, we believe that we have to go beyond even the science. We have to kind of tap, tap the underprivileged communities. So we are forging alliances with historically Black communities as well as universities to really assess uh, you know, what we might be missing to the point that was made. And number three, I think we've got to enroll the future generation. So we are trying to do more post postdocs, internships, fellowships. They're mm -hmm. short, they're not all very long, or doing the resident exchanges. 
And finally, I think COVID taught us that with the virtual, a lot of amazing science is possible. So while it's always good to have uh, residents come in and postdocs be with us, what can we do virtually? So we're trying to tackle that. Those would be the three thoughts I'd offer. Well, thank can I, yeah. Can Wait, I also, try. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just in, in response to one aspect of the question um, around artificial intelligence, data science very broadly, um, you know, this is an area that within the regulated um, atmosphere of biopharmaceutical companies, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is still new, brand new. And uh, right now it doesn't, it, it's, it's coming in strong. But the skill sets uh, don't don't necessarily exist yet. They're all it's all in flux. It's all changing. So one, um, you know, this is we don't have to think of of academic industry collaborations as always like you know establish a, a biology research program, a medical research program, sign a contract to it. It can be more organic. Like in the case, I'd like to highlight an example where um, in the J&J &J system, where a data science team was built very expertly internally, uh, absolutely key uh, first advisors and then eventually collaborators became uh, Dina Katabi and Regina Barzilay. And, um, you know, the even though admittedly, like they wouldn't have had the same degree of seasoning, right, with, uh, with uh, research and development type activities uh, as, as, extraordinary MIT professors, they they were able to, you know, get up that learning curve incredibly fast and brought such freshness uh, to a team that otherwise couldn't have been had. And um, now Regina and Phil Sharp work on, on J Clinic, and that's a, an entire uh, entity that, you, that, that many of the listeners know well within MIT. And um, Dean is off uh, running a company on a very important measurement around Emerald. These things, I think, couldn't have necessarily been all anticipated, all the, the impact on all sides of the equation here, um, but they can begin organically as well. So, Again, the the emphasis on different approaches, different models. Not everyone should try the same thing. Um, I think is important. And you've pointed out the importance of actually just starting the conversation, because yes. again, you know, I, I mean, I've you know seen both Dina and Regina, and they've been fabulous. But they are um, their students, <laughs> as I said, are the lunatics, yes. and the, yes. just, exactly. you know, you know, around hundred yards once they get the yes. ball. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think I'm getting the uh, the. Uh, Hugh, that um, we're running over time. Uh, what a surprise. <laughs> Thank you all for joining me in this really interesting conversation. And I, I really trust that all of us together will figure out a way to accelerate progress going forward. Sorry, Andy, over to you. Thank you. Not at all, Susan. Thank you very much. And thanks for the hope. So let's turn on the polling question so we can get our audience involved and see how the audience reacts to... Uh, to all that great content. Uh, all right, good. So let's pull up, if we could please pull up the polling question. And for all of you, please, if you could chime in, academics have improved their ability to perform reproducible research to industry standards. I love that. We're bringing academicians up to industry <laughs> standards. A, not at all. B, a small amount. C, a large amount. And D, Totally. I really like this question and I'm very interested to see where we land. I think we have more of an industry uh, audience than an academic audience, even though it's mixed. So, so we'll see what, we'll see where the audience takes this question. So great. So we'll have a minute or two to answer that poll. Thank you. And before we, I introduce our next panel, if I could bring up the results of the polling question. Uh, great. So, ooh, interesting. Academics have improved their, improved their ability to perform reproducible research to industry standards. And actually, we're not feeling very confident about the reproducibility of academic research in this panel. We see only, uh, we see the majority of people, 60% actually um, voted only a small amount. So, so and I'll remind everybody that I, I don't have the list of participants, but this is predominantly, I would imagine, an industry um, audience. So be interesting to ask that same question, uh, Susan, to an academic audience. <laughs>